It seems like everybody's got a bit of a rough voice today because of the wind. If you've been outside today, it's just blowing so strongly. All that dust, all that allergy, all that pollen. But in the name of Jesus, we're going to get through tonight with the word that God wants to give to all of us. I don't know about you, but I believe in my heart, according to the scripture that we're about to read, that God, in the middle of your disobedience, still has a plan for your life. In the middle of your mess, in the middle of your sin, in the middle of your confusion, in the middle of your rebellion, God is setting you up for an encounter with Him. God wants to see you. God wants to have a face-to-face -face contact with you. God wants to communicate how He loves you, how much He wants you, how much He wants to redeem you, that no matter how deep you go, no matter how many sins you commit, doesn't matter how many crimes you have done, how many people you don't like, how many people you don't trust, how many people you don't care to be near with, even though you may feel like this, God still has a plan for you, and in your situation, God can show you the way out. God can heal you out of that sickness. God can provide a way where there is no way. And God is the answer to the questions that you have in your life. If you open the word of God with me in Luke 19 verses 1 to 10. Luke 19 verses 1 to 10. And I, mess I put the message of this sermon. Never done this before. This is the word of God for people that have never done this before. It says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and walked on him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I get half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus is prepared to enter into the final stretch of his ministry. He knows that his time is almost up. He knows that there's no more too many miracles are going to happen. He's, he knows that he's not going to be preaching to many crowds. He knows that there's not going to be so much time for more deliverance. Or signs and dreams and visions. So as he is getting ready for his arrest, crucifixion, and later his resurrection. He has to make some pretty interesting stops along the way. And the Bible here tells us he came to a place by Jericho. And he entered the city as he was passing through. It's interesting because Jesus did not have to stop in the city. There wasn't anything important. There was no celebration. There was no special festival. There was no special celebration. And yet God, in the middle of what we don't consider important, He finds something and someone that is more than enough for Him to stop by. He finds somebody in need that even though they don't feel that they need God, even though they feel their life is okay, even though they're making it through and it doesn't seem like their life is a mess, God still has a message for them. God still has a message for the society. God still has a message for this world where people think that we're doing okay. We seem to be doing all right. Finances are okay. The businesses are doing all right. It seems that the country is still growing and we're still able to have employment. We're still able to have health care. We're still able to have benefits. And yet we are just like this city of Jericho where we feel that we're okay. But God knows that his time on this earth is almost up. He knows that he's going to return once again. And he knows that he cannot come until he finds you. Jesus knows that he cannot come again and restore 
the peace of this world. He knows that he cannot come again before the second coming of the Lord till he finds you. He needs to speak with you. He needs to talk to you. He needs to let you know that even though you think everything is okay, life is not okay. Because what is it for you to gain everything in this world and yet lose your life? What is it for you to have all the riches of the world and yet feel poor in spirit? What is it for you to have all the achievements and yet be struggling with a disease or an addiction? God has an appointment that he has set before the beginning of time to come and speak with you. And he comes and looks for a name. For a person by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus means innocent. Zacchaeus means pure. But he's anything but innocent. He's anything but pure. He is a Hebrew by birth. But he's an employee of the Roman Empire. And not only is he a tax collector. But he is the chief tax collector. He is the boss of all the tax collectors. He is the CEO. Everybody answers to Zacchaeus. To be a tax collector would mean that this was not a job that you went and applied with your resume. This was not something that it came because you have a lot of experience. But to be a tax collector you had to bid for the job. Sometimes when you go to construction sites, people will look at bids to see who it could build the building for the most cheapest price that will build with all the same materials, with all the same deadlines, with all the same construction crew, but who can do it for the cheapest? Well, this bid would be the opposite is who would pay the most in order to get this job. So this job was not for the poor. This job was not for those that were struggling. This job was not for those that did not come from rich families. This job was not for the common person like you and me. These positions, when they became available, you had to raise so much money and give it over to the Roman Empire. And so a lot of tax collectors themselves would go into debt in order to have this job. But in order, once they got the job, they would pay back their debts by the money they ripped people off by collecting their taxes. Because you see, just like today, they tax you for gas. They tax you for food. They tax you at your job. They tax you when you die. They tax you once a year when you got to pay your taxes. They tax you when you sell a house and you got to transfer land. They tax you and tax you and tax you and tax you. And that's the same time as Zacchaeus. They would tax people for weddings. They would tax people for permits. They would tax people for property. If you were going to buy an animal, you would pay taxes for all those things. So nothing that you would purchase... Nothing that you would sell was able to avoid taxes. And there was nothing that would happen in a city that a tax collector would not be aware of. He was almost better than a mayor. He was better than any criminal. He was better than any security firm. Because anybody that was new, the tax collector would know. If anybody would leave, the tax collector would know. And somebody got divorced... The tax collector would know. If somebody got a new job, the tax collector would know. If somebody bought a house, the tax collector would know. The tax collector would know when you were sleeping. The tax collector would know when you were eating. The tax collector would know anything you did in your day. And Zacchaeus was the best of the best. He was so good that he didn't need to work as hard anymore because he now had people under him that would collect taxes and they would pay him money so they would be able to rip other people off. And so he now lived off the profit 
from what other tax collectors would get. It was a perfect system for corruption. The rich would get richer and the poor would get poorer. He was gifted, but in the wrong area. Have you ever met somebody who was good at doing the wrong thing? Have you ever met people that was so natural for them to try to always choose what is wrong instead of doing what is right? I have met people through my job at the courts who are so good at lying, so good at manipulating, so good at stealing, so good at selling counterfeit goods. Some people are so good that they can get drugs within 10 minutes. Other people can get access to weapons within half an hour. Some people are so good at doing what is wrong. And even when they get caught, they never get nervous. They know how to circumvent the law. They know how to find a loophole so they don't have to serve as much time. To them, going into prison is not a hard thing. For them, it's just another chance for them to connect with other thieves, other criminals. So that once they get out, they already know what they're going to do. They already know what the next job is going to be. But there comes a point in time that no matter how good you think you are, there will come a point in time that you will put your life at too much risk. That you will realize that committing crimes has made you forget that you also have a life and you now don't have a family. You missed out time with your children. You missed out time on having a legacy that you can leave behind for your family. You find out that no matter how good you are at doing the wrong thing, Crime doesn't pay. Sin doesn't pay. Addiction, there's nothing you can ever brag about uh, at the end of the day that an addiction did for you, that abusing people did for you, that hating people did for you. There comes a point in time where we all realize that if we live a life that just does the wrong thing, nothing, nothing that we do will ever be enough. Nothing will be enough to get you satisfied. You will never have enough time to save away for your for your retirement because you're always looking how to score. You're always looking for the next big hit. You're always looking for the next thing in order to uh, to get ahead in life. But you realize soon and very soon that you cannot get away with everything. He was gifted. In the wrong area. He was gifted in deceit. He was gifted in manipulation. He was gifted in lying. He was gifted in hurting people. He was gifted in not caring. He was gifted in hiding his true emotions. He was gifted at robbing from the poorest of the poor. And he did not blink. He did not cry. He did not feel sorry. You would think that even if you would know somebody like Zacchaeus, you would want nothing to do with that person. You wouldn't want to be their friend, much less married to them, much less be related to them. You would think that they are a waste of time, you think maybe they're a waste of breath. And yet God, the Son of God, came looking for Zacchaeus. How can a loving and caring and forgiving God be looking for a man that was anything but what Jesus was? It seemed like a contradiction. It seems like it doesn't make sense. But when I look at my life, it didn't make sense for Christ to come looking for me either. It didn't make sense for God to forgive me. It didn't make sense for God 
to give of his own son to die for my own sins. It didn't make sense for me to come to church. It didn't make sense for me to ask for forgiveness. And yet, here we are tonight, you and me. We have come to a place where it did not make sense for God to rescue us. And yet, here we are because of his grace, because of his love, because of his mercy, because his forgiveness, because you and I have a bit of Zacchaeus in us. And we wouldn't find our way into a church if it wasn't God looking for us. If it wasn't God speaking to us. If it wasn't God coming near to us and calling us by our name and saying, come down because tonight I will be in your house. Tonight I will forgive you of your sins. Tonight I will heal you from your sickness. Tonight I will give you revelation to what you are asking for me. I thank the Lord that even though I was lost, He found me. Even though I was dirty, He cleaned me. Even though I was without any forgiveness, He still gave up a son that no matter where I was in my life, I could never go too deep, too far, or too astray that God couldn't find me. It seemed like Zacchaeus had it all. He had the life. He had the family. He had the riches. He had the name. He had a legacy. But there comes an interesting point in the Bible. Because even though he was gifted... Even though he seemed like he had it all. The Bible says that he was a short man. A short man in stature. Do you know. That sometimes the richest people in the world. Are the most depressed people. Do you know. That sometimes the most famous people in the world. Are the people that suffer from the worst anxiety in the world. Did you know. That some of the prettiest people in the world. Worry if they're ever going to outgrow their looks. And they're going to get too old. That people are not going to care for them anymore. Did you know. That sometimes. The people that seem to have it all. Are so insecure. They're so unsure. They're not really thinking that people really care for them. Here, Zacchaeus had it all. But he was short. He was short on happiness. He was short on acceptance. He was short on compassion. He was short on kindness. He was short on family life. He was short on his relationship with God. Question is tonight, brothers and sisters, what are we short with with God? What is it that you seem to show everybody that you have it together, but God says in this area of your life, you're short. You're short with your patience. You're short with your time. You're short with your giving. You're short with your praise. You're short with your devotion. You're short with your faith. You're short with whatever I need you to do for me. What is it of God that we are short of tonight, brothers and sisters? Because if we look at ourselves honestly, if we look at our lives and really look deep into it, what is it for us to gain the whole world and yet lose our soul? Like Mark chapter 8, 36 says, what is it for me to have everything and yet die alone what does it mean for me to be the most famous and yet people forget about me when I get old what is it for me to build an empire and yet lose my family along the way it seems That in order to gain something in one area, you've got to lose out in the other. When you overextend yourself doing one thing, another area gets left behind. When you're trying to overcompensate in one area because you want to hide your weakness in another, you will always, always come up short. He thought he had life figured out, but he was short. He was short. 
and they realize that no matter what he had, he still did not have God. That no matter what he had, he still did not have peace. No matter what he had, he really had no true meaning of love. No matter what he had, he really had no true friends. No matter how many times he got high, he really did not know what was a life without any addiction. No matter what he had, he did not know what it was like to have friends that he could actually trust. No matter what he had, he never realized what it was like to truly be accepted for who he is. That no matter what he had, he never knew that true success does not come counted by how much money you have in your bank account, but it comes from how much gladness and joy you have in your heart. He did not really understand that when it comes to really things that matter, it's not about money, it's not about fame, it's not about riches, it's not about cars, and it's not about houses. It's about having the peace of God and knowing that my Savior lives, that my Redeemer is alive. And that he looks after me. And that he speaks with me. And he walks me with me. And he guides me every step of my way. And even though I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For he is with me. That is to have everything. To have it all. Sometimes means you got to lose it all. In order to gain a life. you got to lose this life. In order to have it all. Sometimes you got to surrender it all to the feet of Christ Jesus. He was trying to see Jesus. But verse 3 says he could not. Because of the crowd. What is getting in the way of you seeing Jesus? I already got enough issues of my own. I got enough self-doubt. Maybe I have poor self-esteem. Maybe I have a poor self-image of myself. I doubt myself. I question everything I do. I don't think I'm smart enough. I don't think I'm pretty enough. I don't think I'm meant for this job. I don't think I can be a good parent. I don't think I'm a good spouse. I mean, I got enough stuff going between my ears that even though I have all this noise, I still have to deal with the noise that's happening out there. I have to deal with other people's emotions. I got to deal with other people's disbelief. I have to deal with other people's point of views. I got to deal with other people's rudeness. I got to deal with other people's lack of responsibilities. I got to deal with all types of things in my life. So if it wasn't bad enough that when I go to bed, there's still noise happening in my head. That when I open up my eyes, I got to deal with my family. I got to deal with my kids. I got to deal with my boss. I got to deal with driving to work. I got to deal with how to pay the bills. I got to deal with how to make it another week without losing my mind. I got to deal with my health. I got to deal with sore muscles. I got to deal with my issues. What is getting in the way of you seeing Jesus today? What is telling you that you're not good enough? What's telling you that you're not a son of God? What's making you doubt that God could ever speak with you? What is getting in the way of you seeing Jesus directly? What is getting in the way of your praise? What is getting in the way of your joy? What is getting in the way of your hallelujah? What is getting in the way of you walking in power and authority? Ezekiel wanted to see Jesus, but he could not because there was other people that were getting in his way. What is getting in your way? Do you know that you realize that if you always compare yourself to the crowd, you're always going to be shorter than they are. If you compare your looks to somebody else, I'm sorry to tell you, 
There's always going to be someone who's prettier. There's always going to be someone who is skinnier. There's going to be someone who is lighter or darker. There's going to be someone who is shorter or taller. There's always going to be somebody who is stronger or younger. When you start comparing yourself to other people, there will always be people that seek to have a better life than you. There will always be people that always have a bigger house than you. There will always be people that drive nicer cars than you. There will always be people that have bigger Christmas gifts than you. There will always be people that seem to go on bigger vacations than you could ever afford. There will always be people. But if you compare yourself to other people, you're always going to come up short. You're always going to be unhappy. You're always going to be anxious. You're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to live a life of happiness because when you compare yourself to the crowd, I'm sorry, but it's meant for you to come up short. It's you it's meant for you never to have enough. But God said I never wanted you to compare yourself to other people I need you to see me as I see you I see you blessed I see you redeemed I see you with a plan I see you with a future I see you as one that walks in power and authority I see you as one who is redeemed by Christ Jesus I see you as a leader I see you as a prophet I see you as a praiser I see you as one who speaks in tongues don't look at the crowd, Zacchaeus. Look at me. Look at the one that comes for you. Look at the one that needs you. Look at the one that loves you. No other person in this world can ever take your place. You were designed specially for this moment. You were designed for the family that you're in. For the job that you are. For the calling that God has given you. Nobody else could have done it. Nobody else could have been in, to be able to fit the way you fit in your situation. So stop asking God to give you what other people have. Instead of saying, God, give me what's mine. God, allow me to see my gifts. Lord, increase my strength. God, give me more vision. God, give me a more understanding. God, give me a more sense of acceptance. God, let me be more than satisfied in what you give me. It's not in what other people have. It's what God wants to give you to the people you have. It's not wondering what other people are having tonight or how they're living your, their lives. When you are worrying more about their lives than you're worrying more about your life, guess what? You're missing out on your life right now. That's what happens in this world today. Oh, did you see what that person had for dinner? Oh, did you see what that famous person is doing right now in the world? Did you see what that other people are doing? The question is, what are you doing with the time that God is giving you right now? What are you doing with the resources God is giving you right now? What are you doing with the gifts that God is giving you right now? What are you doing with the opportunity that God is giving you right now? Well, don't waste your time comparing yourself. Don't waste your time looking at the crowd. Don't look at, waste time believing people who are fake. People who are not right. People who want to show a life that they don't really have. When Zacchaeus looked at the crowd, he realized, I'm not like them. I'm always going to come up short. Even though I'm rich, I'm still short. Even though I'm powerful, I'm still short. Even though I have a lot of money, I'm still short. When you look at yourself in the mirror of society, we're never going to be right. We're never going to be the right color. We're never going to be the right people. We're never going to be the right gender. We're never going to be the right for the situation. We're never going to be the right to have, buy a home. We're never going to be right in order to get finance for a car. When you look at yourself in society, society will always say, uh-uh, you don't meet the requirements. You don't meet the requirements to enter into college. You don't meet the requirements for the loan. You don't meet the requirements for this. You don't meet the requirements for that. I'm sorry about you. But I'm tired of people closing the doors. Because they have put a standard. That I have to live up to. But I thank the Lord. That I worship a God. That has an open door policy. I worship a God. That when I look for him. He will find me. I praise God. That I believe in a God. That loves me no matter who. 
who I am. God accepts me no matter what I'm going through and uh, believes in me even though I don't believe in myself. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but there's a spirit of God here that is trying to break a spirit of acceptance of the world. That's trying to break that understanding that you've got to compare yourself to other people. The world is not about selfies. The world is about looking yourself in the Bible and saying, I need to be a better believer. I need to be a better worshiper. I need to live, live life in spirit. It's not about this world. This world will come to an end. This world will come to its own destruction. But for me and my house, I believe that we have a new mansion in glory. I believe that we have a new place in a new Jerusalem. I believe that we will praise the Lord day and night forever and ever because he is the light of the world. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is my redemption. He is the Ancient of Days. He is the strong tower. He is the mighty rock. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He may have fallen short when he compared himself to the crowd. But it was not impossible for God to still find him. Where other people tell you it's not possible. When people say it's not credible, when other people say it's not believable, you have the God of the impossible. You have the God of miracles. You have the God that separates the Red Sea. You have the God that walks on water. You have the God that shuts the mouth of lions. You have the God that turns down the heat of a fiery furnace. And if he can make a way where there was no way, I believe in the name of God that whatever he puts in your life, whatever he lays in your hand, whatever he puts in your spirit, whatever he puts a seed in your mind, he will make it grow no matter what comes, no matter what happens, no matter the situation. I thank God that the people who tried to bury me, the people who thought that I was forgotten, the people that thought that I was of no use, the people that put all types of garbage and dirt over me, I thank God that they did not realize that I am a seed. And sometimes I need to get dirty in order to grow through the darkness. Sometimes I need to be covered in order for me to see the light. Sometimes I need to be covered by the things that people reject me because by being covered, I die to myself and I can grow in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, he says, So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree in order to see him. For he was about to pass that way. Sometimes life gives you short windows of opportunity. He was short. He was corrupt. He was a sinful man. But one thing that Zacchaeus was not is that the man was not dumb. He knew. He knew that there's certain opportunities in life that don't wait forever. He knew because he had been in a job that he had to outbid other people in order to be the chief tax collector. He knew there was a small window of opportunity where you could charge people for certain taxes, for certain festivals. There was a small window of opportunity to make money. There was a small opportunity in order to, for him to increase his finances. And he also realized that there was a small opportunity for him to find holiness in the middle of darkness. But the Bible says that even though he went up the tree, the tree was covered in leaves and he was still in hiding. Hiding in his own tree so no one could see him and that he continued to live in darkness. I wonder 
how many times I come to church and I still come to church while I'm still hanging in my tree. I want to see God, but I don't want other people to know that I'm a Christian. I want to have faith, but I still doubt every time God tells me or gives me a word. I want to be forgiven, but I still live in sin. I want another breakthrough, but I'm still chained down to my addiction. I want God to bless me, yet I'm bad with finances. How long have we lived in a tree trying to get a better view of what other people are having? Trying to get a better view of Jesus. Trying to get a better scope or perspective of what's going on. But the problem is that as long as we're hanging in a tree, we're still living in darkness. We're still trying to hide our shame. We're still trying to not live through purity. We're trying to hide everything that we're living in. It's amazing that a man whose name is purity, a man whose name means, as we read in the beginning, means innocence is looking for the son of a carpenter, the son of a dirty carpenter from a dirty city as Nazareth was looking to see if this man was really pure. But that is the amazing thing about God. That he is Emmanuel. God with us. That when you have a question, you can still reach up to him. When your heart is unclean, you can find the one who cleanses away all our sins. When you're lost in this world, you can still reach out and find the good shepherd. When you feel you're locked in, the good, in a prison, then you can feel, still find the one who calls himself the door, the way, the truth, and the life. I thank the Lord. That when I did not make sense for me to find what is pure, what is right, and what is holy, God can still provide me that step on how to reach His holiness, how to reach His righteousness, how to live a godly life. And it's not overnight. It's not going to be something that you go to bed tonight and tomorrow you just wake up holy, holier than the angels, holier than the saints. No, it's part of a process. There are things you've got to walk away from. There's things you've got to say no. There's music you've got to throw out of your house. There are things you've got to end. There's relationships you've got to say, uh uh, I can't hang out with those folks no more. There are things you've got to look about your own life and say, I'm not going to carry that baggage anymore. I'm not going to carry that self doubt. I'm not going to be self abusive. I'm not going to be self hateful. I'm not going to be self doubtful. In the name of Jesus, I will find the one that will restore everything I have lost. I will find the one that is the lifter of my head. I will find the one whose help I can count on. The one who will never leave me nor forsake me. The Bible tells us that in the beginning of Genesis, Adam and Eve hid their shame, their nakedness with leaves. Zacchaeus was hiding his own nakedness in the leaves of the sycamore tree. We try to be one thing in one area, but we hide in a tree when it comes to seeing Jesus. We hide behind the Bible, behind, behind, behind a chain and a cross around our necks. We hide behind praise and worship. We hide be behind envelopes of offerings. We hide and hide and hide. Who told you you were naked? God asked Adam. Who told you you were not good enough for me? Who told you I couldn't forgive you? 
Who told you I couldn't break you out of that anxiety and depression? Who told you you were not good enough? Who told you you were not pretty enough? Who told you you were not worthy to praise the name of the Lord? Who told you that you couldn't walk on water? Who told you you couldn't multiply the bread and the fish? Who told you you couldn't heal the sick and deliver those that were oppressed? Who told you? Who told you? Who told you? Is that not anybody told you? Is that you found a tree in order to hide yourself? What are we hiding behind today? God wants to see you. God wants to show you what he's all about. God wants to be power in your life. But as long as you keep hiding, he will always notice you and you will always notice him. But you will never have true fellowship because you will always be ashamed of your shortcoming. You will always be ashamed of your past. You will always be ashamed of where you came from. You will always be ashamed of your childhood. You will always be ashamed of where you are. You will always be ashamed of what God has given you. I am here to remind you today that you were worship a God that has noticed you even before you were in your mother's womb. You are in the presence of the Lord God Almighty the forgiver of everything and the one that gives us another opportunity. The one that can redeem you. The God that can give you his grace. The God that can give you his abundance and the God that can give you his acceptance in order to call him Abba Father. And just like God the Father was able to see Adam through the leaves, God the Son sees Zacchaeus through the leaves, through the cover, through the stature, through all the titles, through all the prestige, through all the fame, through the success, through the pain, through the darkness. And he calls him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Zacchaeus, you have been doing this to yourself for too long. Zacchaeus, you don't need to suffer another minute. Zacchaeus, you don't need to doubt yourself. Zacchaeus, I want to love you. Zacchaeus, I want to embrace you. Zacchaeus, I'm here to accept you. Zacchaeus, I'm here to forgive you. Zacchaeus, I'm here to heal your heart. Zacchaeus, I am the one that you have been seeking all this time. I will not wait another minute in order for me to have communication with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is calling your name tonight. And he's saying, come down immediately. Let go of what you thought you couldn't let go of. Oh, surrender that that you thought you could never surrender. Give over that thing in your life that you need to find forgiveness for. Let go of that immediately. I need you to come down. Come down, Zacchaeus. Because that tree was not meant for you, you were not meant to suffer. You were not meant to doubt what God could do. You are never meant to be rejected by others. You were never meant to be let go and be abused. You were never meant to be forgotten. Come down. Come down. Right now. I need you. I want you. I see you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to criticize you. Maybe for the first time in his life, Zacchaeus 
heard the voice of innocence speaking through the darkness. For the first time, he saw the purity of God that he had never seen in the temple, that he had never seen in the synagogue. Because Zacchaeus was in the temple. Zacchaeus was in the synagogue because people had to pay a tax for the animals they were going to sacrifice. He has seen the blessings of the priest. He has seen the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He has seen how they opened the scrolls and spoke from the books of Jeremiah, Isaiah. How they spoke of Moses and Elijah. But none of them had ever spoke through the darkness like Jesus. Nobody had ever spoken like they could, like Jesus could, to call him by his name. And to tell him, I have a plan for you. A plan that comes with no charge. A plan that's never going to cost you more than what you're willing to give. For my plan of salvation is free. The Bible tells us in, in verse 8 and 9. So then Zacchaeus stood up solemnly and declared to the Lord, See, Lord. That half of my goods I now give by the way of restoration to the poor. If I have cheated anyone out of anything, I now restore four times as much. And when Jesus said to him today, salvation, salvation. It wasn't just the spiritual salvation, but he was only also revealing that the Messiah had now come to all the members of your house. Because you too are a son of Abraham. If you remember the story of Abraham, Abraham had two sons. One with his, the servant of his wife. And one with his own wife. The Bible says that they were almost both killed by the tree. For there came a time where Sarah said to Abraham, Look at what your servant Hagar has done. Look how her son torments my son. It's time for her to leave our house. And the man of faith, the father of nations, the one whose seed was going to bring Jesus looks at the servant Hagar, looks at his son Ishmael, and tells him, You guys got to go. He gives her bread, he gives her water, and he sets them off into the wilderness. The Bible says that the water and the food ran out. And Hagar put her son Ishmael underneath a tree, underneath a bush, and she thought her son was going to die. But the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, do not leave your son behind, because God will bless him. And Ishmael and his mother lived. Even though he thought he was going to die by the tree. The Bible also tells us that there came a time where God spoke to Abraham. And he says, you've got to take Isaac to the mountain. Because I need a sacrifice. And he took the boy. He loaded up the donkey. He put the wood for the altar. He brought the fire. He brought the knife. And the boy asked, Dad, where is the lamb to sacrifice? And Abraham kept saying, the God will provide. God will provide. And he laid his son on the wood of a dead tree. But God told Abraham, do not 
hurt the boy. And there in the middle of another tree was a ram caught by its horns. Because no son of Abraham was ever going to die by the tree. When Zacchaeus was called the son of Abraham, God was fulfilling the prophecy that he gave to Abraham. That none of his children were ever going to die by the tree. That you were not going to die in the tree of guilt. You were not going to die in the tree of shame. You were not going to die in the guilt of anxiety. You're never going to die in the tree of loneliness. You will never die in the tree of lack of acceptance. You'll never die in the tree of lack of faith. You'll never die in the tree of lack of God's provision in your life. I call out in the name of Jesus that none of the children of Abraham, spiritual children, we will ever die in a tree because God, He is the Son of Abraham and there is no other but to take His place. For He climbed the tree where you and I should have died. He climbed the tree that you and I should have been nailed to. He climbed the tree and carried all of our burdens. He carried all of our shame. He carried all of our mistakes. He carried all our impurities. And what Ishmael could not do, what Isaac could not do, and what Zacchaeus could not do, only the Son of God could climb a tree and hang there all day long. And he did not give with his spirit until he knew that you could have been saved, until he knew that you could have been healed, until he knew that you could be restored, until you realized that you could be redeemed by the grace of God. There was only one that could give of his life on the tree. No other. And his name is Jesus. He climbed the tree where nobody else could climb it. He carried the cross where nobody else was worthy of it. And he was put in a place called the skull. Golgotha. The place of death. The place of transgression. The place where heaven and earth cried. And there was a giant earthquake. And he only he by hanging on the tree could rip the curtain of the temple from top to bottom. Only he by hanging on the tree could descend to hell and take the keys of death. Only he by hanging from the tree could tell the devil that you will forever be defeated. That only he, the son of God, who would hang from a tree could ever redeem what was been lost. I thank God that in order for Zacchaeus to see Jesus, he needed to change the altitude that he was at. You see, in order for you to see where God wants to take you, you've got to get a little bit higher than the crowd. You've got to get higher than the noise. You've got to get higher from the perspective of the people. You gotta get higher than other people's faith. You gotta get higher than what other people are telling you as a word of advice. You gotta get higher and higher and higher for what Jesus wants to do in your life. You gotta get higher and higher to what God wants to show you in this world. You gotta get higher and higher in what God wants to give you of Jesus. You gotta get a little bit higher in order to see the goodness of God. God give me a new perspective. God give me a new vision. God give me a new way of looking at life in this world today. God, let me see what you have for me. God, show me. God, reveal to me that I will not die by the tree, but that I will grow in the goodness of God, that I will grow in the mercies of the Lord, that day by day, I will get a little bit stronger. Day by day, I will have a little bit more faith. That day by day, I will stop comparing myself to other people and the noise of this world. Amen. What I find interesting is that when you look at a tree, what do you see on the limbs of a tree? You don't see roots. You don't see more trunk. But the only thing that can grow in the limb of a tree are the fruits. Mm. 
you got to believe in faith. That the higher I grow in my faith, the more that God is going to show me the fruits of the Spirit. That God's going to show me the fruits of joy and goodness in my life. That God will show me more of his mercy and his blessings for me every day. Zacchaeus had never done this before. Zacchaeus had done a lot of things. But he had never climbed a tree because of faith. He had never climbed a tree because he believed. He had never climbed a tree to make a difference. Maybe it's not a mountain. Maybe it's not a tree. But maybe you face an uphill battle right now. And it's so easy just to stay at the bottom and compare yourself to the crowd. It's so easy just to complain about our lives. It's so easy to say how other people have it easier than you. But it doesn't take everybody to climb a tree. To keep going forward. When other people could have given up, God is calling you to take another step. When other people say you couldn't be done, God says believe in faith that it will be done. When you feel that there is no answer, God is saying the answer is already on its way. When you feel that you're going through a time of drought, God said the rain is already on its way. I don't know what you need of God today, but God is saying to you, the higher you climb, the closer you're coming to your blessing. The higher you climb, the more you're coming into the day that your salvation will be here. The day you come closer and closer to me is the day that I will call you by my, by your name. And I will tell you that tonight, salvation has come into your house. That tonight, your answers to your prayers have come. That tonight, that healing is now taking form of your body. That tonight, whatever you will be needing in the name of Jesus, if you believe it and keep on fighting, if you keep on taking the next step, if you keep going and forward, if you keep believing in faith, God will find you. God will show up. And God will call you because nothing and no one is too lost for God. Nothing and no one is too impossible for God to redeem. And nothing and no one is too far lost in the darkness that God cannot call you out through the light of Christ Jesus. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the people that are gathered here and those who are listening. God, I ask you that this word stir something in their spirit to them to realize that they're not meant to be at the root of the tree. They're not meant to be the trunk of the tree, but only fruit can grow, grow in the limb of a tree. That you have called them to go higher and higher because you want the fruit of the spirit to grow stronger and stronger, Father. And that they might not use the tree to hide themselves, that they might not use the tree in order to sacrifice of themselves because only one is worthy of sacrifice. His name is Jesus. For he climbed the tree and he was nailed to the tree and he did not give of his life to the to his spirit to the Father until he knew that each and every one of us would be saved. I thank you for that gift, Father. That people that have never done this before will start believing in faith. That people that never really surrendered of themselves before will give of their life today. That people that have never trusted before will start trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that your word does not return void. We know that you're not a deaf God. We know that you're not a mute God. We know that you're not a dead God. For you are alive. For you are alive. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity. I thank you for this word. And I bless your people. In the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen.